dream a little bit and experiment and, and play to see where you know you can open up opportunities in, in other places hello and welcome to the business of architecture i'm your host ryan willard and this week i had the good fortune of visiting acrylicize a multidisciplinary design studio based in hackney so we went and visited their new fabulous offices uh, right by the canal there and they've really cornered a niche market uh, which occupies a number of different territories from fine art from design to interior design to architecture um, and also creating brand experience and brand awareness in corporate and commercial environments. So I sat down and spoke with Global Managing Director Paul Arad, and he discussed with me the inception uh, of the business and how he and founder James Burke back in their university days came up with the idea, how they found their first clients, how they negotiated those early contracts, how they nurtured those relationships and how they've grown the business into an international design firm with offices here in London, in New York and Seattle. So really fascinating conversation. One of the values that Paul really leans into in this conversation is leading with love. And I really like this idea as a way of just developing client relationships, attracting talent and nurturing your team so talent sticks around for a long time. So sit back, relax and enjoy Paul Arad. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Paul, cool. welcome to the business of architecture. How are you? All good. All good. Thanks for having me. Absolute. Very exciting to be here in your new offices. Um, you guys have been here for four weeks, you were just saying? Yeah, we've done a month ago. Excellent. And how's the move been? It's been great. I mean, we've been, we've been looking for the right space for a, a couple of years. Um, we had a few places, didn't quite fit the bill. Um, so when we found this, it was, yeah, it was incredibly exciting to be able to <clears throat> bring to life the vision that we've had for a while for, you know, the ideal evolved work workplace um, and really to sort of, most importantly, just provide the most fertile ground for, for the team and for our client base and for people to be creative, be themselves and, you know, be in a, a wonderful environment together. Brilliant. So you're the, the managing director of Acrylicize. Yep. Um, how would you describe what you guys do? And I, I, just before you do that, I mean, I've been following your guys' work for quite a few years. I, I, as I was telling you earlier, I visited you guys in your studio up near Red Church Street a few years back and have always been really, really inspired and admired the, the, the premise and the concept of kind of bringing art installations into a commercial environment and the, the quality of the artwork is fantastic and it's also just melding these interesting sectors from like interior design architecture product design fine art mm. and also kind of brand and brand experience yeah um how, how would you describe what it is that you guys do i think you've done a pretty good job just there <laughs> but um i think fundamentally we've, we've always been inspired by making creativity as accessible as possible. And I think the original spark for <clears throat> the project and the business that, that, that we've been running for 18 years has been to um, make connections with, with people and environments and, and using art and creativity to do that. <clears throat> so that's had various different forms from when we first started and kind of what our initial offering was. Um, but it's, it's really about telling people stories, bringing their experiences, their personality, their, their missions to life. Uh, and we believe that art and, and design has an incredible power and, um, and ability to do that and, and connect people, bring people together. Um, so um, I suppose fundamentally, in terms of what our output is um, now, is very much working with global businesses, local businesses, um, things from one-off pieces to full art schemes across, you know, multiple sites. 
um, and trying to create environments that people love and feel inspired and connected by um, and bringing people together. Um, a key phrase that, that, that we use and is very true to our, um, our existence is the joy of expression. Um, and we want our teams to be able to do that and express themselves in their truest form. Um, we want to be able to do that for our clients as well mm. so that the, um, the output of what we're doing is, is, is really testament to some of the intangibles, some of the things that sometimes might be written in a mission statement or might be you know, a slogan here and there, but how you bring that to life and how you create um, that you know, wonderful sense of, of togetherness and purpose in the, uh, in the environments that we work in. How did the business begin? So you've got your co-founder James, yes, um, and, and you guys have got quite different backgrounds and, yeah, different, so, and quite differing roles in how you or how you've structured the business. Yeah, so James, James and myself have been friends since we were about twelve years old, right? So kind of you know knew each other back in the day. Um, we were at university together in Manchester. Um, James, very talented musician, artist. Um, and I'd always been quite inspired by his view of the world uh, and where he wanted to take his skills and, and how to, um, I suppose, turn that into something tangible. Um, and I think that's kind of where we came together. Um, I come from a slightly different background, was m more you know, a history student, um, didn't necessarily have a huge um, background in art and creativity, but the connection between me and James worked really well. All kind of the things that I wanted to do and was inspired by, um, he was less interested in all the things that he wanted to do. Um, I was interested, but it wasn't necessarily my skill set. So fundamentally as a, as a partnership, it was kind of that creative and that commercial elements coming together. James would come up with some ideas, I'd try and find some clients. And that was kind of basically, and still is to some extent, sort of the core of, of what we both bring to the table. Um, I think the thing that has really helped us along our journey is the communication and the dynamic between us both. So we have a huge amount of respect for each other, want to hear each other's opinions, don't always agree on everything, but in a really positive way. Mm -hmm. You can work through those challenges as there always is as you're running a business. Um, so um, the inception was James's final year art project at university. And he was like, right, um, I need to drive this forward in some way. Um, and I was working a few summer jobs, not really sure what I wanted to do with my life. Um, and we spoke and it seemed like a good way that I'd start picking up the phone. He'd do his thing and see where that journey went. And that was uh, yeah, back in 2004. So what was, what was the initial project? Was it very much a question of you had art and you wanted to find somewhere to put it? Or was it that you identified the kind of problems that you're seeing now with some mm. of the clients that you've got so and you I think the art was the solution to that yeah so knowing that trying to penetrate the art world trying to make it as an artist trying to bring creativity and actually earn a living out of it I think is quite a, a you're not really sure what the route is mm. you know especially when you go from um you know, educational facility and then into the real world um, with real things like, you know, paying rent and feeding yourself and whatnot. How do you kind of bridge that? Um, and I think the educational system, um, certainly when we were there, was not doing a particularly good job of, of preparing students in the creative sector for what life actually looks like. Um, so I think it took a lot of conviction and self-confidence from James's perspective to say, well, you know what, I'm going to I'm going to make this a go and I think mindset is such a huge part of of running a business uh, and and of being able to make things a reality and I think that really drove us because we didn't have we didn't know how to do a pitch document we didn't know how to present you know we weren't taught these things and I think you either just pick that up and you learn as you do um, and kind of out of the textbooks but the initial product and the initial inception of, of, of acrylicize was acrylic artworks and that was kind of where we got our name from. And the right. idea was that we were trying to reinvent the traditional canvas, the traditional way that imagery was displayed. So James had developed in his final year degree these acrylic artworks with images applied directly to it. It was kind of also at a time where, you know, you had the iPod generation, just the look and the feel really sat nicely with how interior design and general mm. aesthetics were working in interiors. Um, and we went to, we were calling up developers and basically anyone with lots of wall space and saying, hey, before you go and buy 
a bunch of stretch canvases or whatever it is you might do. How about this product? And here's all the benefits of it. It looks great. It's you know has has lots of you know. Um, so that that's quite a leap in innovation itself, as you know, from a from a creative standpoint, or what like a, what a fine artist would normally do, which would mm-hmm. be kind of looking to establish roots into galleries and building up their kind of you know the, the, their their credentials, yeah. if you like, and, and then be looking to you know to, to get representation and then sell work that way. And as and again, it's a kind of quite an elitist process. Yeah. What What was the idea behind you know what let's find up developers, let's look for people who have got space. Mm-hmm. Was that just that of a conversation or? Well, I think you to to that point. Where, if there's barriers to getting in place, so I did go door knocking down Cork Street and round Mayfair and like, hey. Do, do you like the work that, you know, my business partner's doing? Um, and it's not that whether they liked it or not was less of a thing. It was just more of like, we're not about to put you all over the walls. Yeah. And, 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 the, and I suppose the route to making it as a successful solo artist is, you know, um, is a very different and, you know, challenging and based on so many factors that sometimes aren't always based necessarily on the pure talent. Um, but who's kind of giving that cred- credibility? Mm-hmm. You know, what's what are the box tick? You know, tickers that have have meant that actually we're giving value to this. So <clears throat> the only thing we could do is think, okay, well, we've got to think differently about how we approach this. Um, and I think the point about developers and people with walls are like, well, we know there's this huge gap, and this is kind of the the, the, the insight we had that at one end of the market, if you were looking to put bring art into your work home environment um you know online prints and and elements like that were kind of you know starting to to go on the rise so you'd kind of go down that route which is more of a, a, the affordable end or you would have a business that where there's a an art committee or ceo or the, or, or the key personnel who were making those kind of decisions for the rest of the business um and we saw a big gap in the market which you know was with through developers, sport venues, workplace, where <clears throat> how can we use art in a slightly different way? So rather than it being the collection of one or a few individuals or just the, the mission statement on the wall mm. or some nice pictures, how can we create something here that feels a little bit more integrated into the business, can bring to life elements that perhaps stories that hadn't been told and create a working environment which is, is inspiring to, to, to be a part of. Um, and I think that's kind of at the same time that this was happening, you saw a huge shift in the workplace environment, right? And in terms of how the experiences people were trying to create for visitors. Um, the first projects that we won, the sort of major projects were actually in, in the sport sector. Right. Uh, and that was at Wembley Stadium and Arsenal. Um, and again, you had a new offering. You had a hospitality band, which was taking up a huge portion of the, the stadiums, um, creating a huge amount of revenue for businesses. And all of a sudden, we've got to kind of change our approach. So if you think about the previous stadiums of of yesteryear, um, it was less about that. And now you had a a new wave and a new market of of clientele who had different expectation levels and therefore how they were fitted out, the experience, the pre-match, post-match was all part of that. So I think that the interiors had to raise their game and that's Mm -hmm. also an area where we felt there's an opportunity here. Um, And then it was a case of picking up the phone. And I know that it's like, it sounds basic and I still to this day, I just think that, you know, there's nothing more important than making connections, speaking to people. Um, you know, you can't wait for things to kind of just fall. You've got to go out there yeah. and kind of make it happen. And to be fair, we, we, we had no experience of it any other way. So um, there was certainly some positive naivety about that process. Um, and we kind of went into every pitch and, and, and still do with, you know, we've got to make the decision. We've got to make, create a case where there isn't a decision, right? The client's just like, yeah, this makes sense. It kind of ticks every box. Why wouldn't we do this? Um, and so I think that energy and that enthusiasm towards how we try to <clears throat> win business was, you know, integral to, you know, the success of the business. Mm. And, and, and I think reigns true every single day. You know, there's always... You know, there's always alternatives. There's always other options for clients, and and it's important for us to present ourselves in a way that is is meaningful, is authentic, and um, you know creates added value. to were you, to were you finding, particularly in the early days, that it was 
you know, did you have much competition? Were you offering quite a unique proposition? Because I, I can imagine, you know, when we think about, um, you know, large corporate uh, environments and sometimes they might commission, you know, a well-known artist to do something. And obviously, again, that, that pathway to becoming an individual artist is so different. And here you're actually, well, it's a service and you're listening to what the client's needs are, there's listening to what the brand is about, what the experience wants to be like, what their, what their visitor experience wants to be like. And I, that's, a, that's a very different way that an artist would approach mm. something, because now we're moving into the world of design. And it's, but it's not quite interior design either. Well, I, I always find this quite fascinating, because when you talk about art, and when you talk about art in a traditional context, um, you know, Michelangelo and the Sistine Chapel, Right, was commissioned to do something for the church, right? So it was, I mean, obviously an incredible artist, but fundamentally was this is a commission for a, a bigger mission, right? And yeah. this is what we're trying to say and this is what we want, how you want to deliver it. Um, and I think there's always been that balance between artists in terms of earning a living mm -hmm. and commercially trying to get to a certain place and then also being able to truly express their view on the world. And I think that in... You know, in, in today's version of that, people are wanting to, you know, personalise every experience and ensure that their how they're coming across, how their environments are, their people, their 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 offering is, you know, is as bespoke as possible to the to the client base. And I think that's kind of where where we found ourselves was in this middle ground between art, design, brand, and I think we've always been quite happy about not saying here's the box we sit in because I think the beauty of, of, of what we do and the beauty of the, the creative industry is that there is flow between mm -hmm. those different elements so you know we you know we, we did a thought piece on you know the, um, the the balance between fine art and brand where does that where does that sit and if you look through you know art history there's lots of examples of where those two things have kind of come together mm -hmm. where there's a corporate and commercial and financially driven world to some extent and then the true expression of you know the artist uh, and we're quite open and quite you know proud of playing in that space um, so you do get those conversations what well, is it art is it design is it this is it that and I think well it's always been like do this. we have to define it yeah as yeah, in yeah. like what what are we trying to achieve from this we're trying to create you know a, a better connection better experiences more access accessibility uh, whether it be in public realm or inside, you know, an ind individual sort of workplace. So I think that uh, that's kind of what we lead from. How can we make a difference? How can we do something that represents authentic creativity, but also is to, you know, benefit the, mm. the wider environment? Um, so, so when you were kind of hitting the phones mm -hmm. and drumming up the new business, <coughs> what, you know, what, what, what kind of things were you saying and how did you strategize? How did you know who to choose? How did you, how were you identifying who were the right people to call? Um, <clears throat> I would love to tell you that it was sort of, you know, very carefully calculated and, and considered. Um, but I'm, I'm a big believer in, in action. I yeah. thought, and I think that you can spend a week thinking about who should we contact and how should we contact them and what's the approach and there's just no better, no better experience than picking up the phone and being like, okay, I probably shouldn't say that <laughs> next time or I'd frame it differently. But um, I think one of the big lessons and which I heard from an architect, which um, when I heard it for the first time was, you know, we had two ears and one mouth for a reason. Um, and I think a lot of it was just listening to people and understanding what the challenge was, whether it be we've got this great space and we're thinking about how to, you know, elevate that experience. And here's kind of what we were thinking of, or here's the challenges we've had previously. Um, so I think a lot of the conversations we were having initially was just kind of hearing hearing people, like what was what was good about the an experience that you went through previously and what was bad about that and what do you feel it was missing? And then that allowed us to be like, okay, well, this is what we're hearing and here's how we can then respond. So in our pitch presentations, um, we would try and be as focused, and that's where kind of strategy would play a much bigger role. Because then you're like, right, well, here's the here's the issue or the or, or the challenges that maybe they're facing, and here's how I think we can we can uh, you know resolve that and, and and help with that. 
Um, but until you start picking up the phone, until you start going to meetings, you don't really get that sense. And then you start, I feel like when you have those conversations with people, you start getting insight into well, what their trajectory is and what their goals are. And actually we're looking at all these different sites and how we can kind of bring them together or how they can be separate entities and giving them a, a unique sense and of character and, and whatnot. So um, it was at the beginning, I would say, you know, it was pretty machine gun, right? Like, as in just like, well, here's a developer. Oh, oh, for example, Wembley, um, which was like the first proper job we won. And we didn't really have any jobs that we had won beforehand that were in any way comparable in terms of check out our case studies. But I, I remember it like it was yesterday, me and James, I grew up near Wembley. Me and James went down to the Twin Towers, for those that remember, uh, this has been 2004, um, and we drove down, stood at the base of Wembley Stadium, and we were like, obviously it was being teared down, and we were like, okay, we got to get in here. Like, this is just a dream project. And then from that point, as soon as you have that initial, you know, spark of like, you know, right, great, we can do it. And not having gone through any experiences of like, well, it might be difficult, there might be competitors, or we were just like, right, how can we get in? And we managed to find a contact who knew somebody at the club. And long story short, we managed to get a meeting. And then in that meeting, we basically had, you know, spent two weeks making videos and samples. And we didn't even know what they wanted, but we just kind of went in there with like, you know, an armory of, we're here to help. We were local. We were a local business, so we we definitely leaned into that card, right. um, and um, fortunately, we're su successful. Um, it was you know a bit of a, a a bumpy ride to getting it because we made a lot of mistakes in terms of our. Well, I guess you know, the, the other the other thing is that the business itself is quite unique in terms of its proposition, and like, where do you go to model yourself on? Like, mm. who do you ask for help or, or what other companies, what other companies were you sort of looking at and going, want to be a little bit like that? Or was that never really no, a I, conversation? No, it's a really good question. I mean, we had, we had up in the, in the studio in the original place that we had, which was in, in Harrow, um, we had um, images that James had pulled from various businesses. One was a firm called Frog Design, who did a lot of work for Apple um, back in the day. And there were, and there were these, and we had big, companies and brands and, and buildings and places that we were like just inspired by. Um, you know, I always remember we, you know, like I said with, you know, Wembley was, was kind of one of those ones that we kind of had it up and we were like, all right, this is kind of the target. Um, and I think from the company perspective, we looked at businesses that we felt were doing things differently and didn't maybe quite fit into a mold of a traditional you know, brand agency or an artist. And so I think we took inspiration from many different things. Um, James has always been very, he's a graffiti artist and was always inspired by the, the hip hop culture. And I think the, the interesting thing or the, you know, the lesson we took from that was, you know, it's kind of a mashup of various different, um, you know, genres and, and you know, um, elements that come, come together to form new things. And I think that's kind of where we took a lot of inspiration is in how can we take elements of the art world, the design world, the interiors world, the corporate world, and kind of model something that felt new and felt interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's kind of always been at the forefront. Um, we don't want to be like anybody else. We want to be us. It's the only thing we have. It's the only thing I think every business has, right, is that the essence of who you are, what you bring to the table, your approach to things, um, you know, your, your, your view on the world. So we've always tried to stay really true to that and ensure that, follow that with sometimes blind faith and hope that, you know, that, that takes you on that journey. And I suppose the other component of that is being humble and self-aware mm. enough to know where, okay, that's not working as well. So. A really good example of that is when we, the original product that we had, which I mentioned, with the acrylic panels, and that's kind of what adorned the walls of, of Wembley and Arsenal. Um, we then saw people popping up all over the place offering a very similar product. And I always remember I got a call from somebody who was interested in purchasing. I was like, well, you know, I've gone online and I found, you know, three other businesses that um, we feel like there's a like for like, you know, you, what's the difference kind of thing. And it was kind of one of those moments where I was like, okay, this has probably run its cycle. We need to keep adapting. And you know, a one quote we used to have up in the, in the studio is the nature of design is to re redesign itself. Mm. Um, and I suppose never to 
just rest and be like, you know. So, so that's quite interesting. So at the early days, were you doing the production work your, yourself in terms of like those acrylic panels? Was that something that was done in-house? And then was there this transition from, you know, kind of from that into, okay, now the project's become more involved, more complex, like, and how do we deliver that? Yeah, so um, originally, when it was myself and James, and there was a, a couple of others early on, we we were the the outfit for clients who would design what would happen on the artworks and in the space. You know, we would go down, do the site visits, measure up, meet the client, create all the artwork, and and kind of mock, mock all that up. And then we would use a two different fabricators, so one who basically cut all the artworks and the panels in the way that we had subscribed and then a printer and that was kind of the the uh the route that we went mm. uh, and we were kind of the, the people bringing that all together and then delivering that so we would then install it as well so from a client perspective they were getting that service you know directly from us um and i think that how that helped us in terms of a mindset was realizing that there's so many incredible people making stuff from a one, you know, a one person shop to larger, you know, factories, metal workers and all sorts of things. So when we started to develop out of the acrylic canvas, if you like, and realizing that, well, actually there's opportunities in these areas to go really big and expansive and three dimensional and really take it somewhere. Um, we realized that actually we could develop this network to be able to realize those things. Um, and, yeah, that was kind of the, I think the, like I said, a, a bit of a moment after a few years where we realised, okay, there's um, not only was there more competition for what we were doing, but also we knew we had so much more to give uh, in terms of, you know, our creative aspirations and, and, and ideas. Um, and I think that actually having that network of, of fabrication partners and, and specialists meant that we could really, mm. we could dream anything and then make that happen. Um, as opposed to, you know, being right. This is a particular machine or production techniques that we want to own in house. I actually, felt that would be more restrictive for us creatively. Um, so that was kind of where that, you know, where that process led to. When the team started to grow, how were you identifying who it was that you needed and which disciplines that you should be looking at and. Yeah. You know, should we get a designer, should we get an artist, or should we need a project manager? How were those sort of decisions made and, 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 and how was the company kind of, you know, how were you strategizing about growth or was it more organic? Um, so I, I think some of that was organic and some of that was by realizing, okay, we can't go down this road again. Um, and I think that the, the strategic stuff was, I think, more straightforward on a creative perspective because we would take on a brief and say, we're going to design something that's you know got lighting in it or has more of a three-dimensional element to it and that kind of quite simply meant right we need this kind of skill set in. we need someone who can model that up we need someone who can help think of those ideas and develop them so that was i would say a slightly easier journey um i think on the because when we set up i was kind of doing everything operationally business delivery wise and james was running the creative side um, we started to deliver projects that were much more ambitious than we had ever sort of thought. And um, I feel like that's a really good place to be in the sense of you don't want to be too comfortable, right? Mm. And I think that um, that moment where we realised, okay, we need to widen our, you know, our, or, or put, you know, more of a creative um, wider view on, on things um, meant that we were taking on projects that were like, quite dreamy in terms of the execution. Um, there was a particular project that was, was a great success in the end, but it was a moment where I was like, okay, I'm, I'm not a project manager. Um, and when you're finding yourselves from 10 p.m. to 3 a.m. in the morning on site, you know, because that was the only time you could access. And whilst I think we were naturally good at kind of bringing people together and bringing the right teams together, I just didn't have the skill set. I didn't have the, yeah. you know, the, the experience or, or, or the qualifications to like really understand all the details of, you know, the, the, the nuances with engineers and various other things. So, you know, there was, there were a couple of projects where we got through it, but it was a, an amazing wake up call to yeah. be like, okay, we need a PM team if we're going to be delivering these kind of works. And then I think what you find is that the more, you know, it's like that moment of like, okay, there's so many better people out there to be doing all these tasks. And to be honest with you, that's kind of been 
the thing ever since mm. and realise that, you know, whilst it's important for us to set the high level strategy and the, the culture and kind of put those things out there and give overall direction, there's just, you know, so many amazing people out there who make all those ideas come to life. Um, so that was definitely a moment for me personally where I realised, A, this isn't what I'm best at. Um, and here's kind of where I need to focus. And if we build out this in this way, um, we're going to be so much more successful. Um, you know, it's getting the right people doing the things that they love doing that are going to add value to the overall offering. Mm. So I think that was, yeah, you have those moments, which I'm, which are the, which at the time felt like, how are we going to get through this? <laughs> but give you amazing perspective. And I always look back on some of those moments and with, with, great appreciation that had I not had that maybe I would have come to that realization later um, and I think that's part of that challenge of like how you prepare yourself and it's something that we do a lot now with with um, with, with students and within education to like help people you know cross that bridge between in textbooks and kind of studying stuff and then the real world and mm. like when you've not you know, we went straight from education straight into into this so I wasn't aware that you've got to do things in this way. Um, and that's kind of where um, it's it's super important to for us to constantly be checking in. You know, we're doing this in the best way we can. Should we seek some external counsel? And, yeah. You know, um, so I think a lot of it early days was, was, was organic because you're kind of responding to what, what is in front of you. And then I think fortunately with a bit more experience and a bit more perspective, it becomes a lot more strategic. Mm-hmm. Were there points when you started to have that external counsel in terms of consultants who were advising on things like PR or marketing or was that kind of kept in-house or, or any other kind of business advice? So I think, to be honest with you, from day one, we were, wanted to sort of be sponges in the world of, you know, business, creativity. Um, I think we've always had a, a passion and a desire to, to learn and to probably be quite self-critical of, of, of ourselves um, and you've got to find that right balance right between you know not ensuring that you're doing it in a way that's going to push you forward but I would find that and to this very day you know anyone that I come across where I feel like you know I think everyone has something to, to offer and everyone's got mm-hmm. an insight and something and a perspective doesn't necessarily tie into their particular experience somewhere but you know you're learning things every you know every every moment of, of a day. So I think that we'd always gone, we'd always been quite active about, like, for example, there were a couple of very successful um, um, business leaders who we had done some work for. And our immediate thing afterwards was like, do you mind if we come in for a chat? You know, kind of here's where we are. Here's what we're, we're thinking moving forward. And just for people to kind of challenge you and nudge you. And, and, and so we've, we've kind of always tried to um, have that component, you know, within how we run things. Mm. Um, when you first started and versus now, how has how you structure your fees changed? And I can imagine that been quite a, I mean, for many designers and architects, that's quite a, a difficult thing, how we, how we meant to, to set our fees on this, what's mm. the rule of thumbs that we should be using, how are we allocating budget from the fees? And obviously you guys have kind of moved from, you know, you were the one sort of product type mm. and then getting into ever more complex projects. How has that kind of evolved and how important has it been to you in terms of making sure that you've got good solid invoicing structures and mm. that you're actually making sure that you're charging enough? Um, good question. Not a simple answer, but I think the, so initially the offering, because it was more product based, um, initially we weren't charging anything for design. Um, right. And I think that was in part because a lot of, we found that a lot of the approach to creatives, um, which is not a good thing, is you do this for free, you think of an idea, if we like it, we'll kind of move forward. Yeah. Um, and there is, you know, there's lots of, you know, unfortunate jokes about this within the creative industry that, you know, it's not perhaps given the same level of, you know, authority or, or you know value that it probably should do you know someone's ideas uh, and and you know concepts for things are you know I believe worth you know 
worth paying for and 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 I think it's 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 definitely moved more in that direction mm. but when we first started it kind of felt like that dynamic and maybe that was something that we you know were putting out there as well because of our own you know experiences or or feeling like that's kind of yeah. how you win business um and I still think to this day there's a huge level of you know there'll be projects that we pitch on and want to think of ideas for and and to, to put ourselves in the best position but it really came about when we started to hire people just from a very basic perspective, when it was mine and James's time, we didn't calculate it in the same way. We thought, well, great, if we get someone buys 100 artworks from us, we can make margin on that, and that's all good. Um, as with every business, there's more costs that come in, people and you know space and equipment and all these other things, you then get into a little bit more of, okay, well, okay, here's what our operational costs are. Um, and if we sell this amount of artwork what that would look like but hang on we've got three creatives now and a project manager who we need to then bill out their time so that was kind of the first place where we got into it also coincided with the scale of projects we were working on so we'd be getting involved in projects not just from a we would like to purchase x amount of artworks from you but actually we need you know deeper level sort of concept mm. or, or we need to you to liaise with the architects and be on site and attend meetings and so all of a sudden we started to realize well we need to be able to charge for those things. And, and to be fair, in that context, there's no pushback from clients as to you should be charging for that. Yeah. Um, so that obviously helped to develop that, that structure. Um, I think we've always been very mindful of the financials, always trying to strike that perfect balance between taking on the right kind of jobs that will pay, but also allow us to create the kind of work that we are passionate about and want to push the studio forward to. There's always ones where you're like, okay, is this probably more of a financial decision than creative and, and vice versa? So it's balancing that with the overall cash flows and you know what you know is the, the pipeline and all those other things that I um, have always been very passionate about ensuring that you know we're reaching a large number of people. You know, not every opportunity results in a in a win for a number of reasons. Um, so I think to, to, to my earlier point, the idea of sort of getting our name out there and, and, and also hopefully the nature of working with really good clients and, and architects and, and, you know, design teams where your name gets thrown around is mm. obviously, you know, a, a crucial part of that. Um, nowadays, I think it's, it's seen as much more of a, a want. I found that I used to have to go into places and kind of convince people that it might be a good, I think, good idea to bring this kind of creativity into a space certainly in the workplace sector which has obviously had you know uh, any, any well a revolution to you know some extent in terms of how we're all working what the workplace means um i think the demand to create spaces that you know really appeal to to staff um help with staff retention help with you know client engagement um has meant that the kind of offering that we have i think is more of a a need than you know a nice to have that's really interesting that you know you're starting to change your value proposition because it's not just you know something that looks pretty inside of the in the space it's got an influence on the actual performance of the business and is contributing to these quite very important aspects of the company like staff retention and, and client experience and and brand how did your um, value proposition. How has that shifted from the early days till till now? And you know, how do you how do you communicate it to clients? Um, well, I, I think when you're looking at a any a, any project that we that, that we might look at currently, I think the kind of questions or the kind of wants from clients um, are vastly different to what they once were. For example, people are thinking about you know how do we create if it's a public realm space, how do we create footfall? How do we, you know, keep people in environments so they feel actually this is a great space to be in. They're going to be utilizing, you know, a food and beverage offering. They're going to be spending more time and and money in, a, in an environment. So there's that component. Um, if you're talking about experiences and on a on a match day in a in a sports sector, as we kind of touched on, you know, it's a similar kind of experience. It's not just coming for the game, it's coming for the before, the after, the overall experience. It might be client entertainment, it might be events throughout the calendar year that are not just for that event. So how do we create an environment that really is 
appealing and, and not just for, um, for visitors, but also for, 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 for staff and people utilising the, the space on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and I think workplaces, as, as we've touched on, is, is, you know, everybody is thinking about what that looks like. And whilst there's been, you know, lots of innovation already over the last couple of years, everyone's still trying to find their feet and trying to find out what the right combination is. And we have, you know, our thoughts on, you know, what, what that looks like for us at the moment, uh, which, you know, our space here is very much sort of, um, you know, a realisation of that. Um, so I think that, you know, there's, there's a community aspect, you know, people are, are, are in, a, in a really positive way, much more conscious about how we engage community and that might be from local artists to you know um certainly when there's planning consent required how we onboard you know residents and and, and visitors to a, to a space to ensure that they feel connected they feel there's benefit and value to them so again okay well how does art and creativity and and that play into mm. into that realm um so i think people have just got a, a much more socially conscious frame i think the the, the days of we can put an office out there that basically has desks and chairs and you need to be there from nine to five. It just doesn't exist anymore. People have choice. You know, there, there's a huge power shift from employer to employee in a, in, a, in a really positive way. And therefore, you know, businesses, spaces, offerings need to work much, much harder um, to bring people together and to create, you know, ultimate experiences. Um, so I think that all those components um, and look, there's a there's a whole there's a, a plethora of you know elements that make that all happen. You know, we work you know fortunately with some incredibly talented architects and you know design firms who you know are pioneering mm. you know um, those elements. And I think that we we plug in and dovetail really nicely with 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 what they do in terms of bringing that you know additional layer of you know of, of art and, and creativity to you know. The schemes and the projects we work on so I find now the kind of conversations you have with clients are, are just much more engaging are just right. much more you know okay how can we how can we push push it this way how can we create an even better experience here and that's amazing for businesses like ourselves because it forces us to think about what we're doing and the best way we're doing that and and uh, you've got a nice kind of cycle there of you know creating spaces that um sure a financially driven to, to to an extent for um but i think it's 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 a lot more than that now um how do you know when to say no to a client or when you realize it's a it's not a fit mm. or like or perhaps and perhaps sometimes it might be something that you've pursued and courted a particular prospect or client and then mm. realize actually no what this is not going to be a fit does that, does that ever happen like you kind of yeah for sure um i mean i think it's there's probably two aspects of that one is sort of you know the relationship and one is sort of the work so I think you know we have a a system you know of we call the north star of like a project potential comes in and we will assess based on a number of factors is this the right project for us is it going to be able to you know fit to our sort of creative philosophy will it be sort of a game-changing project does it work for us financially does the timeline work does you know all these kind of components that you think you know and sometimes you don't even need to look at that because you're like boom this is something that 100% we're all over and other times you kind of got to make that cool um, and sometimes it just may not be the right fit you know in terms of what the creative aspiration is um, in terms of a number of logistical factors that just may not not suit um, so I think there's that kind of the creative and the financial. And then the other thing is the relationship. You know, we're all about, you know, which I think the fundamentals of everything that we do is about relationships and it's about working with great people. And I think that we're always trying to, you know, assess, you know, are we the right fit for them and vice versa? Is this the right client for us? Um, and I think testament to a lot of the relationships that we have, um, it's it's not client supplier it's like we're on the same team yeah um and i think if you if you know that okay that's going to be that journey um that gives you know great inspiration to the team that gives great you know um well, that, that that's you know, really interesting that you've maintained that relationship and you haven't it hasn't become client and commodity or client mm -hmm. and you know like you say supplier what are some of the 
the things that you ensure have to be in place to maintain that parity in the relationship? Um, I mean, I think, put simply, we do our very best to hire brilliant people who are brilliant at what they do, and most importantly, you know, lead with love. Mm. You know, that's one of our sort of core values. You know, just be a nice person, first and foremost, right? We know that we're not gonna get everything right 100% of the time. We know that not every single idea that we come up with is gonna be the winning idea. Um, that's fine, I'm comfortable with that journey. I'm comfortable with that, you know, as you navigate through projects. Um, what we look for in any relationship is just sort of mutual respect and understanding and appreciation of what everyone's trying to do. Um, and, you know, I think that kind of really is, is at the forefront. And I think if you, if you, I mean, there's been a number of times where, where you know, you have to, you know, look at a certain project and be like, okay, look, we need to adapt it in this way and that way, or have a conversation with the client because uh, costs have come in and they're higher than anticipated for a number of reasons, or there's a timing thing with, and again, if you have a, a base of like with any good relationship where they know you're trying to do everything you can, okay, not the ideal scenario, how can we work around it? It's such a more fruitful and positive experience to have, I think, to, to go into any kind of, you know, business arena and think that everything's going to be absolutely perfect every step of the way is just, you know, is, is naive, maybe the naivety we had early on. Um, so I think when you have that awareness, you then work to make sure that you can build as strong relationships as possible, deliver the best work you can, um, and be open. You know, like we want feedback from, we encourage it between our staff, with our clients, you know, we, you know, it's a fundamental aspect of getting better and, mm. and realizing where you could have done things differently. And wow, if I didn't have that insight, we might be on a different course. Um, so I think that, you know, it's all those sort of components are really sort of, you know, crucial. Um, and probably the, one of the key things, which I think um, is a big um, factor for us is, is fear. So when there are some relationships, fortunately, none that we're working on at the moment where you have there's kind of a fear that's kind of come from somewhere and we've got to get this in in this way and we're worried about what this one might think of that and whatever else and I, I always think with any again with any relationships not necessarily business wise it's not a great starting point yeah you want to be in a position where you're like right we're supportive of you vice versa we want to keep each other in in, in check make sure we're delivering what we need to deliver uh, and when that comes from a good place of like we're trying to do something really awesome here and let's let's do this together, you know, it's just a completely different, you know, game you're playing. Um, you guys have now got, you obviously, the new office here. You've got an office in New York mm -hmm. and is it somewhere else as well. And in Seattle. In Seattle as well. Okay, so now, so now it's, you know, it's an international um, business. You're moving into, you know, a, a very kind of difficult commercial environment in the States or lots of different challenges. How have you been, number one, how have you been attracting team and talent and retaining that talent? And then what's been the process of doing that in a completely new country? Um, so I think in terms of talent, um, I think, we, you know, we, we, we look first and foremost for sort of, you know, attitude probably rather than as well as skill. But um, I know it's quite, it, it can be a cliche, but it's very true in terms of, you know, you can learn skills and I'm not sure you can learn, you can change attitudes in the same way. Sure. So I think that first and foremost, we just want great people who are passionate about what they want to do and we want to give them um, space and time and, and, and energy to be able to, to do that and express themselves. So I think that um, that's a kind of key component in terms of, bringing people in. I think we want to make sure constantly that we're listening to people, that we're hearing, you know, you know, at every stage of one's career, um, there's different things at play, right? There might be things on a personal level. There might be like, well, I was doing this and now I kind of want to go into this direction. So I think it's, you know, it's a constant, you know, levers and, you know, dials to kind of get all those exactly right. But it's, it's trying to get people on the trajectory that they're on aligned with the trajectory that, you know, we need to take the business. Um, and so that's a, a key component. I think when you get that right, um, it, you know, it unlocks and opens up, you know, um, 
opportunity that you didn't even think existed before. Um, so that kind of those those two lanes, I think, are, are, are crucial to kind of get right. Um, in terms of attracting, you know, talent, we, you know, we just try to be ourselves, and we just try to, you know, we are what we are, right? So we, um, in terms of the kind of work that we put out, in terms of the kind of events or the, you know, the, you know, the thought pieces and, and whatever it is, we just, I, we're not overly obsessed with, you know, worrying about what we should be doing and more focused on, you know, this feels right, this feels, you know, and I think that's kind of come from that very early place of like, we didn't know what was the right thing or the wrong thing or how to pitch or how to do all these various elements. Yeah. So you kind of try and listen to your, you know, your true self, your instinct in terms of this feels like the right way to do things. Um, and I, I suppose as the business has grown, there's more components that you need to think about. We obviously operate internationally, you know, do lots of work across Europe and the States and whatnot. So there's, you know, a number of different, you know, cultural elements that come into that. Um, but again, that's kind of where you bring in great people who understand that and can, and, and can help, you know, um, with building out that team. And, you know, we, we actually recently just had uh, the day we opened here, we had our US team all over um, for a week long, a criticized week of, you know, um, you know, fun and workshops and various other things. And I think having that two year period of not being together yeah. um, has really highlighted the importance of, you know, just getting people in the same room. And I think that's another thing which, you know, builds teams, you know, um, it's being able to chat about something completely irrelevant, you know, that's not necessarily work related, but you are starting to understand people, you understand what makes them tick, what's important to them. And that kind of builds, um, I think, much stronger relationships and, and people that are going to go and sort of bat for each other. Mm. Um, so um, that's something that we've been doing a lot more in terms of trying to get everyone together. With moving into the, uh, the US market, um, when you started setting up those offices, was it, this was, did the opportunity just arise? Uh, you wanted or were you kind of strategic and we were like actually we've always wanted to be operating in the US and then was it a case of taking people from the UK and putting them into the US offices or did you kind of develop it more from the ground up so we originally had a, a client in London US business right who we had done some work for and they really delighted with what we had done and had mentioned they had a number of properties in the US that they would like us to look at. Um, and I think me and James had always had a, a passion and a drive to expand beyond Europe. Um, I think we felt that the US market was, you know, a huge market for what we're doing, um, a huge amount of potential clients, opportunities, ways to be creative in on a scale perhaps that, you know, well, just in, 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 in a different arena. Um, and we popped across, had a look at these jobs, and we were like, okay, it seems like it could be good fun. Um, and so initially we um, found somebody locally who who um, instrumental in terms of helping to um, run those projects. And then we did have people going back and forth um, to kind of, you know, design and then be out there and and then slowly, you know, one thing led to another and then it wasn't just that project and there were other opportunities out there and then as soon as you do one it's like then someone hears about this and whatever and it kind of grew grew from that 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 side um but even even now we're trying to you know ensure that there's that connection between yeah. the studios on a physical level and also sort of day to day um because you know having people that understand the business and understand sort of you know some of the you know the history of how we do things and what we do, I think is really important. And then balancing that with, you know, new talent and new ideas and, and fresh ways of doing things. So, um, yeah, it, it started very organically in like a sort of land and expand kind of thing and we'll kind of see what happens. Um, and then, you know, a, a lot of work was moving to New York just in terms of where, you know, some of the key um, opportunities and projects were. Um, and, um, and yeah, I mean, it's... It, it's uh, you know in some respects you know there's it's a much bigger playing field there's you know more competition and mm -hmm. more you know a, a different dynamic but then on the flip side of that you know the opportunities and the, the scale of you know the, the the projects is 
you know, significantly higher than I suppose the, the average scale project yeah. in, in, in the UK. So that's kind of where we felt we could we could really sort of lean in and, and, and make a difference. Amazing. What's next for the rest of 2022? Um, 2022, well, we've got a big event on Thursday, sort of the launch of, launch of our, our space. I mean, this, in, interestingly, I suppose this space and kind of what's next is trying to um, do all the things that bring us all together. And we've always been very passionate about the communities around us, mm -hmm. other artists, other creatives. I mentioned sort of education and, and, and a lot of work. You know, James the other week was doing, you know, talks in, in primary schools about the joy of expression, about being creative, about... You know, trying to instill as much of that as, as possible onto our surrounding environment. So this is a, uh, a place in the art house is somewhere that we can bring all those elements together. Yeah, um, there's no, no shortage of interesting talent next door. And well, yeah, no, exactly. Place. Exactly. And I, th I think, you know, we, you, you know, you, I think the, the creative world that that, you know, needs, you know, as much self-confidence and self-belief as possible. And I think that happens when you kind of interact with others and you see, oh, wow, this person's doing that. And, and, it, and it kind of helps you sort of raise, raise your game. Um, you know, one of the key focuses for us is in terms of our, um, um, the hyper evolved workplace, which is something that we've, uh, we've been developing, which is about sort of our, our take on creating the, the workplace of, of the future and creatively how that infuses in, in spaces. So we've been doing that with uh, a number of sort of key clients globally um, and, doing you know a, a lot more of that because I think there's so much like there's so much transition there's so much you know um, opportunity mm. within as that landscape has, has shifted that we're really excited about what we can what we can do in that space um, and um, yeah I mean I think it's there's never a shortage of ideas and, and, and thoughts about where we can take things it's um, and I now feel that you know um, we've got kind of the environment and the, and the space to really sort of you know take that to the next level and that's kind of always been kind of the dynamic right as in like you do one thing and you're like right okay i think we're, we're doing that pretty well how can we do that better and how can we take that and 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 push on forward um so it's kind of we've we've always seen it as a as like the art project from school days yeah and how that's kind of just developing and layers on top of it um which is quite a nice way I think for us to sort of view it um but we obviously set out targets for things and, and places where we need to you know where we need to be from a commercial and creative perspective but but also allowing space I think that you can get so caught up in the delivery of stuff um but really important to give not just myself and James but the, the whole whole business you know headspace to like yeah dream a little bit and experiment and, and play to see where you know, you can open up opportunities in, in other places. Um, we're doing a, a very big piece at the moment in the the the, the metaverse world. Um, so oh, we've got wow. two of our two of our team who are really sort of focused on that, and we're um, delivering something in September time um, to the to the wider wider world in terms of our thoughts around where we think that could be really interesting in terms of the art landscape um you know which has obviously been a huge part of you know that that conversation so um lots of exciting stuff that you know we're, we're we're really passionate about and really want to push on and see what you know the next iteration of you know what we do and the world around us how that that develops really brilliant Paul well, I think that's a perfect place to conclude the conversation thank you so much for sharing your insights and business experience and just the, the growth of Aquilicize. Thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate it. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable. <laughs>